Hello and welcome to the next webinar in the series brought to you by Strengthening the Heartland. I am Amber Letcher, one of the co-directors of this group, and we are so excited to see so many of you with us today. We have an amazing presenter, one of our favorites here at Strengthening the Heartland. So um, I will introduce her momentarily, but for those of you who are new or if you're returning, welcome back. Um, a couple of housekeeping items for you. So you are welcome to ask questions, type questions into the questions panel um, that should be on the right side of your screen. We typically do those at the end of the webinar, but you can feel free to type those in at any time. Um, you likely won't be able to see them or the others um, that are coming in, but I will relay those to our speaker at the end. Um, we also really appreciate your feedback. So you're going to see a link to a survey um, in the question box. And if you will take a few minutes after the webinar or after the recording, if you're watching that, uh, we'd like to know who is in the room and also what do you want to see next time? What ideas, um, topics that are popping up for you? Feel free to fill that out anytime you watch a webinar. So even if you've done it in the past, Go ahead, take it again. We'll take your new suggestions. And one last thing, if you are interested in joining our email list, we'll put a link to that email also in the chat box. Send us an email, we'll sign you up for the list and then you can hear about all of our upcoming events. And with that, uh, I am gonna turn it over to our guest speaker today, Dr. Amanda Giordano. Uh, thank you so much for being here, take it away. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. I am a very appreciative to Amber and Caitlin and Christine and everyone behind the scenes of Strengthening the Heartland. These are such great resources uh, to have, and I just love that they um, put these on for us. So today we have a lot to cover. I want to try to maximize our time together. We're going to be talking about how to navigate non-suicidal self-injury with youth. So my name is Amanda Giordano. I'm a licensed professional counselor and associate professor Professor of Counseling at the University of Georgia. Uh, you have my email address there. There's a lot of content I want to get to today, so if I don't get to your question or if after this presentation you have a follow-up question for me, please don't hesitate to reach out and send me an email. I love to have conversations about these topics. So let's go ahead and get started. What can you expect in our um, presentation today? So we are gonna cover quite a few things. First, we're gonna start with what is non-suicidal self-injury, just a basic conceptualization, how to understand it. We're gonna look at some prevalence rates and trends, particularly among adolescents. Um, I am going to share with you the proposed diagnostic criteria for NSSI disorder. We'll talk about social media and its role in potentially exposing youth to NSSI or exacerbating um, NSSI engagement. And then we'll end with some assessment instruments, treatment considerations, ethical considerations when working with youth. And then I'll leave you with some fantastic resources so that you can learn more. Okay, let's start with how to conceptualize NSSI. So when we think about non-suicidal self-injury, it's important for us to recognize that this is self-inflicted harm that occurs without the desire to die at the moment that it is occurring. So the purpose or the intent of this um, act is not to end one's life. Um, instead, it's typically used as a means of coping or emotion regulation, which we'll talk about in just a moment. So non-suicidal self-injury is intentional, self-inflicted harm to one's body. Now, it's typically harm caused to the surface of the body, um, like body tissue, without the desire for very severe injury. Um, and of course, it's without the intent to end one's life or to die. 
So there are lots of different forms of NSSI. A lot of people talk about it and they use the word cutting. So we know that cutting is one of the more prevalent forms of non-suicidal self-injury, but there are a lot of other ways that people engage in NSSI beyond cutting. There's burning the skin, scratching the skin to the extent that bleeding occurs, banging one's head on hard objects, carving words or um, drawings into the skin, preventing wounds from healing or embedding objects under the skin, um, punching hard objects so that bruising occurs on fists, sticking pins, needles, or um, staples into the skin. All of these are potential forms of NSSI. So as clinicians, we are looking for cutting, but we don't only assess for cutting behaviors. We are looking for a variety of potential NSSI behaviors. Now, as we are conceptualizing um, self-inflicted injury or harm, we want to make sure that this is not a socially acceptable or socially sanctioned behavior, like getting multiple piercings or multiple tattoos or even some religious um, rituals or traditions that may include an element of pain. That would not fall into the category of NSSI. NSSI has a different motive. Um, than those behaviors. So we want to ensure that we are correct in our conceptualization of NSSI, that we're looking for direct pain-inducing actions to one's body without suicidal intent. Also, as we think about NSSI, we know that the typical locations for um, this type of behavior are the fists, the wrists, the forearms, thighs, and stomach. Now, NSSI can happen at any uh, location of the body, but this is what we see in research as being the most typical locations. So let's talk a little bit about non-suicidal self-injury among adolescents, which is the focus of today's presentation. We know that first NSSI experience typically occurs during the adolescent years. So a couple of um, research studies have uh, shown us these um, first exposure or first encounter or engagement ages among adolescents in Norway. The median age of onset for NSSI was 13.2 years old. And among undergraduates with a history of both suicide and or suicide attempt and NSSI, age of onset was 12.16 years old. So we're looking at that 12, 13, 14 um, range of uh, the adolescent years where first encounter with NSSI or first experience tends to occur. When we look at adolescents across the globe, we see that this is a prevalent um, issue that affects a substantial number of adolescents. So uh, Swanell and colleagues found that 17.2% of adolescents across the globe engaged in NSSI at some point during their lives. Um, my colleagues and I recently <laughs> finished a study and we looked at 350 American adolescents and we found that 25.7%, so about a quarter of them, had engaged in NSSI at some point in their lives. And these were aged 12 to 17. And we also found that 12% of our sample engaged in NSSI in the past year. So this is a prevalent concern globally, but also in the US. We also have some evidence to suggest that NSSI rates are increasing. It's becoming more prevalent. So among American University freshmen, Wester and her colleagues found that recent NSSI, which was defined as NSSI in the past 90 days, increased from 2.6% in 2008 to 19.4% in 2015 among university freshmen. So that's a big jump in prevalence from 2008 to 2015. Also, um, I did a study with some colleagues uh, not too long ago, and we looked at um, presenting concerns that were um, reported by licensed clinicians in the United States. So we had almost 100 licensed clinicians, and almost 96% of them had worked with at least one client who self-injured in the past year. So this is a prevalent concern, something that we're going to see in counseling, something that's prevalent among adolescent clients. Now, like I mentioned before, we're not just assessing for cutting behaviors, but we're looking for a variety of NSSI um, uh, 
engagements and different forms of NSSI, and we found some evidence that there could be gender differences in the type of NSSI that an adolescent engages in. Um, so again, back to our study of uh, 350 adolescents in the U.S., we found the most common forms of NSSI among females were cutting, scratching to the extent that bleeding occurred, preventing wounds from healing, and then biting to the extent that they broke the skin. Among those who identified as male, we found the most prevalent was scratching to the extent that bleeding occurred, cutting, punching self to the extent that bruises appeared, and then banging head on object to the extent that bruises appeared. So some differences in the most prevalent forms of NSSI when we start looking at um, gender differences. Okay. So what are the possible signs of NSSI? And this might be um, good for school counselors to consider or counselors who work with children or adolescents. Are there signs of non-suicidal self-injury that would prompt you to broach the subject with your adolescent client? So some of those possible signs are arms and legs are always covered, even in situations that would call for more exposure, like um, changing in gym class, um, swimming, or warm weather, you see that these adolescents might be wearing long pants or hoodies or long sleeves, even when the situation calls for more skin exposure. Or um, rather than hiding the skin, it could be that there are visible scratches or visible injuries or scars that the adolescent or the child does not explain very convincingly. So it could be that my cat scratched me um, or I accidentally fell on something and that's where I got these bruises. So we're aware of injuries or evidence of um, scratches or scars on the skin that aren't explained away very convincingly. Also, we know that with children and adolescents, being in peer groups with one or more friends who self-injure is a risk factor for that um, adolescent engaging in NSSI themselves. So another possible sign is um, being in a peer group or having friends um, with, who engage in NSSI. Also, something we're going to talk about today is seeking out NSSI content online. So looking for pictures of NSSI or websites and information about NSSI on social media or discussion forums or YouTube videos. We also know that having a mental health concern, um, depression or anxiety or a history of trauma is uh, linked to um, a higher association with NSSI or higher prevalence rates of NSSI. So uh, adolescent clients who are experiencing psychological distress or have a mental health concern may be at higher risk of managing that distress through NSSI. If your client um, reports or demonstrates feelings of hopelessness or despair, a lot of isolation and secrecy, um, all of these could be possible signs of NSSI. So we want to be aware of it so we know when to broach um, NSSI with our clients. Now, another important um, part of our work with NSSI with adolescent clients is understanding the motive of NSSI. Unfortunately, I hear a lot of um, uh, individuals in just the community and lay people talk about NSSI is just a cry for attention. They're just trying to get attention. But as clinicians, we really need to understand the literature and the data around NSSI and what it tells us about the most prevalent motives for this behavior. So we know that rather than an attempt to end one's life, NSSI is typically used as a way to cope with extreme psychological distress, overwhelming psychological psychological pain. But how can inflicting pain on one's body be a way of coping? Well, we're going to dive into that by talking about these potential motives for NSSI among our adolescent clients. The most prevalent um, motive for engaging in NSSI is to change the way the person feels. So emotion regulation, they either want to stop bad feelings, find some sort of relief from psychological distress, or feel better in some way. So almost 53% of adolescents in an inpatient unit said that their primary motive for engaging in NSSI was to stop bad feelings. So there's something about causing harm, causing injury to oneself that can create relief from negative psychological experiences, psychological pain or despair or negative affect. 
another motive beyond emotion regulation is self-punishment. So we see that for adolescents who have some sort of anger towards themselves, they feel guilty about something they have discussed towards their own bodies, they may engage in NSSI as a means of punishing themselves. So 38% of adolescents in um, Doyle's study said that they engage in NSSI to punish themselves for something. So we're looking at that disgust or anger or guilt that may fuel harming oneself as a way to um, give the adolescent client what they feel like they deserve. Another motive is anti-dissociation. And I think this is really interesting that if a client experiences um, chronic trauma or severe trauma, they may dissociate as a way to survive that traumatic event. So they may feel themselves leaving their body. You have a sense of looking down at your body. You feel this out-of-body experience called dissociation. And oftentimes it's a survival mechanism for extreme trauma. What we find is that for some individuals, even after the trauma has ended, they continue to dissociate, especially if they have feelings of fear or panic, um, anxiety, it may trigger a dissociative state, even after the trauma has ended. Some individuals report engaging in NSSI as a way to jar them back into the present moment to stop the dissociation that they feel coming on. So it is an anti-dissociation mechanism. We do have some research that um, women with a history of NSSI experienced more trauma and more abuse than those without a history of NSSI. And the researchers also found that higher dissociation scores were linked to more NSSI. So NSSI can actually be a way to stop dissociation for those who have developed it as the survival mechanism for early trauma. And then finally, um, we do see a motive for NSSI in communication. So they might not have words to explain the depth of their psychological pain, but they can communicate it to others. They can reveal the extent of their pain by harming themselves. And so it can be a way to communicate to others in uh, the adolescent's life. I really like this quote, um, an adolescent's decision to self-harm may not, <clears throat> may not be as much a call for help as a demonstration of felt pain and distress. So it's not just this attention-seeking behavior, but it's a way to demonstrate to others their pain and the level of distress that they are experiencing that they might not know how to vocalize or communicate in words. All this to say, it's really important when we're working with adolescent clients who engage in NSSI to assess the function of the behavior. What's the motive behind their NSSI? So asking questions like, what does self-injury do for you? Or when do you feel the urge to engage in self-injury? That will help us determine, is this um, a means of emotion regulation? Is it a means of self-punishment? Is it a means of anti-dissociation? Is it a way to communicate? Once we figure this out, once we understand the function or the purpose of NSSI, that really helps us plan our treatment more accurately and in a way that's more helpful to the adolescent. If you haven't heard of the book, A Bright Red Scream, I, it, even though it's dated, I still recommend it. I think it's a great way to understand NSSI. So it's not written by a mental health professional. It's actually written by a journalist who is trying to understand this phenomenon of NSSI. So um, it, there's a lot of interviews with individuals who engage in NSSI to understand what it does for them. I thought this was a powerful quote, especially for those who haven't worked with a client who engages in NSSI yet. Um, it can kind of help us understand the motive. And so this individual in the book said, cutting substitutes the pain inside with a physical pain that I can control, which is easier to handle. The pain is now real, tangible. It can be seen. So it's a way of regulating extreme emotional pain or psychological distress by almost transferring it to the physical realm, that the physical pain is seen as more um, easier to control and cope with, and you can actually watch it heal, which is different from psychological pain, which can be really nebulous and abstract and difficult to understand and um, even to visualize a solution for it. 
Okay, so I did want to talk about the relationship between NSSI and suicide. This is really important in our work with clients across the lifespan, but particularly with adolescent clients. So we know that NSSI, even in its name, is distinct from a suicide attempt. It is a non-suicidal self-injury. Um, so there is not the desire or motive to end one's life when the individual is engaging in this self-injurious behavior. However, think about the motives of NSSI. It is used as a way to regulate emotion. So there's likely something in the client's life that's causing extreme psychological pain and psychological distress. So it shouldn't surprise us that these individuals who are trying to cope through NSSI also are at higher risk for suicidal ideation because of whatever is happening in their life that's causing that extreme psychological pain. So they're distinct, but there's a correlation between NSSI and a suicide attempt and suicidal ideation. So as clinicians, we don't want to assume that every time we see injury on an adolescent that it was a suicide attempt. So we don't want to assume NSSI is a failed suicide attempt or evidence of a suicide attempt, but we also want to recognize that those who self-injure who are using that particular coping strategy are more likely to attempt and complete suicide. So when we think about this relationship between NSSI and suicide, we're considering differences in intent, differences in the motive. So like we mentioned, NSSI is typically a client's best attempt to cope with extreme psychological pain. So it's actually life-sustaining. It is an attempt to self-soothe or to manage this psychological distress, where suicide, that behavior, is motivated by the intent to end one's life. So they're distinct in their intentionality, but we know that they may co-occur. So there's a high correlation between NSSI engagement and suicidal ideation, and that's been found in quite a few studies in the literature. So again, we know that those who are engaging in NSSI often are trying to cope with extreme psychological distress that can put them at higher risk for suicide. Wester and Tripal in their book talk about this as common risk factors. So there's something in the client's life that increases their risk both for NSSI as a means of coping and also increases their risk for suicidal ideation or suicide attempt. Now, I talk about NSSI a lot, and sometimes when I um, am talking to particularly reporters or people who are trying to understand this phenomenon, when I explain it as a coping strategy, they follow up and ask, so this may be a silly question, but then why do we want to stop it? If it is an adolescent's best attempt to cope with psychological pain, why are we trying to get them to stop if it's a coping mechanism? The answer that I have really comes from research that shows us it's an ineffective coping strategy. It may be the adolescent's best attempt to cope with psychological pain, but it's not actually dealing with the issue. It's not effective. It's not adaptive long term. And we know this from studies like um, uh, the one that um, Olalan and colleagues uh, conducted in 2021 that looked at individuals with both a history of a suicide attempt as well as a history of NSSI. And what they found was the time between first NSSI experience and first suicide attempt was about three years. So what that tells us is even though the individual might have been relying on NSSI as a coping strategy for extreme psychological pain, it didn't solve the issue, it didn't um, effectively deal with the psychological pain, that pain persisted and three years later they did attempt suicide. So that's why even though we understand NSSI as an adolescent's best attempt to cope, it's not an effective long-term coping strategy. We need to prepare adolescents to rely on more adaptive and and more effective coping strategies, as well as addressing the root of that psychological pain. Uh, as we talk about this relationship between NSSI and suicide, I also think it's important that we consider our intake forms in our clinical work. So a lot of times our intake forms have one item that says something like, 
Have you ever attempted to harm or kill yourself? That's putting self-harm and suicide in the same item. Instead, it would be more helpful if we broke this into two separate items. So asking the question, have you ever deliberately hurt yourself without the desire to die? And have you ever tried to kill yourself? So that we are giving our clients permission to disclose NSSI without the assumption that it's gonna be conceptualized or understood as a suicide attempt. So what about NSSI and borderline? Now, borderline personality disorder used to be the first thing that people would think about when they worked with a client who engaged in NSSI. This is because um, uh, self-mutilating behavior is actually one of the possible criteria for borderline personality disorder in the DSM. So when we see self-injury, then we think, okay, is this a sign of or criteria for borderline personality disorder? And if you think back to your diagno um, diagnosis course, if you haven't worked with a client with um, borderline in a while, borderline personality disorder is really marked by instability in relationships. This very um, visceral and impulsive um, and persistent fear of being abandoned by um, someone who is important to the client. So you see a lot of emotional extremes, these highs and lows, this unstable sense of self and impulsivity. All of that defines borderline personality disorder. For those who meet criteria for borderline, self-harm or self-injury may be a part of that disorder. It could be a reaction to either perceived or real threats of abandonment. It can also be a means of anti-dissociation among those with borderline personality disorder. So when we see NSSI, we also want to assess for borderline personality disorder. We don't want to assume that everyone who engages in NSSI has borderline, but we do want to assess and either rule it out or we are conceptualizing our client as someone with borderline who also engages in NSSI. And that's going to inform our treatment that we want to consider, is there a co-occurring mental health concern like borderline personality disorder? We also know that NSSI can exist as an independent issue, an independent disorder not associated with borderline personality disorder. It could actually be a behavioral addiction. Now, I want to be clear, not all NSSI meets criteria for a behavioral addiction, but some, a subset of individuals who engage in NSSI also meet criteria for it being a behavioral addiction. So when we think about behavioral addictions, we think about activities or um, these behaviors that are both positively and negatively reinforcing. Positive reinforcement is adding something desirable that increases the probability of engaging in that behavior again in the future. So that positive reinforcement could be feelings of pleasure or euphoria, um, feelings of calm. And the negative reinforcement is taking away something undesirable that also increases the probability of engaging in that behavior again in the future. So it could be that when you're engaging in that behavior, you have a temporary escape from depressive symptoms, anxiety, um, your trauma symptoms, conflict in the home, um, low self-esteem, that's negative reinforcement. So in order to be considered a behavioral addiction, it would need to be both positively and negatively reinforcing, as well as meet the four C's of a behavioral addiction. So the four C's model, I really like it. It's easy to remember. It's based on a lot of criteria for addictive behaviors. If the behavior is compulsive, meaning it's not planned or intentional, but it's something that is, um, we engage in it resulting from an urge or a craving rather than a really intentional um, act of engaging in a behavior. There's a loss of control. So maybe we are engaging um, more frequently than we intended or for longer durations than we intended. For NSSI, it could be um, engaging in more severe forms of um, self-injury than we initially intended. It continues despite negative consequences such as um, physical negative consequences, relational, um, emotional, spiritual, financial, educational, or occupational negative consequences. And then when we're not engaging in the behavior, we crave it. We're mentally preoccupied 
preoccupied with it. We're thinking about the next time we can engage. So this could be an adolescent who's sitting in school counting down the minutes until they get home and they're able to engage in NSSI. So if it is positively and negatively reinforcing and we see evidence of the four C's, we can be thinking about NSSI as a behavioral addiction. And in fact, in our study of licensed clinicians, 83% agreed with the fact that for some individuals, NSSI can be an addiction. So we would apply the addiction model to our work with NSSI. So a lot of people ask me, okay, what's the positive reinforcement of harming yourself? So how can engaging in NSSI be positively reinforcing? We understand the negative reinforcement that it can create a distraction or escape from extreme psychological distress, but how is it positively reinforcing? Well, there's a couple of hypotheses that answer that question. First is that the physical pain caused by NSSI activates our endogenous opioid system. So it causes the release of things like endorphins. And this endogenous opioid system induces feelings of calm and relief and almost relaxation. So it could be that NSSI really does induce positive feelings because of the activation of the endogenous opioid system. Also, another hypothesis is physical pain offset. So it's not the act of causing NSSI that is positively reinforcing, but it's when NSSI ends that by removing the source of pain, or by ending the pain, you actually feel pleasure. It's pleasurable when you get that immediate relief from the end of pain. So the individual feels better, feels that relief when they stop cutting or they stop burning. So it's not the NSSI itself, it's the physical pain offset or the end of pain that is pleasurable. So these are the hypotheses around the positive reinforcement of NSSI um, that could qualify as a behavioral addiction. I also want to note that there's burgeoning research that is actually um, uh, quite strong that shows that there's evidence that the neural circuitry that's involved in processing physical pain overlaps with the neural circuitry that is involved in processing emotional pain. So as the individual causes physical pain and then they begin to feel relief from that physical pain as it starts to heal, they can actually feel relief from emotional pain as well. It's almost like tricking the body to believe that there is some healing that's happening to the emotional pain as well as the physical pain. So as physical pain resolves, the emotional pain can feel better too because of this overlap of these neurological circuits. So that's another area that's being researched, but we have some evidence that supporting this overlap between um, those circuits that process physical pain and those that process emotional pain. Okay, so you can read this in the DSM, but I just wanted to highlight that NSSI disorder has been proposed for the DSM. It has not been included in the DSM proper, but is included in um, section three of the DSM-5, which is conditions in need of further study. I wanted you to see the criteria because it really highlights what we've been talking about today, the motives of NSSI, the potential for NSSI to be a behavioral addiction. So the proposed criteria listed in section three would say that um, one or more of the following expectations of NSSI needs to be present. That NSSI will provide relief from negative thoughts or emotions. It will resolve relational conflict as that form of communication or it will induce positive feelings. So all that we've talked about already today. Also, one or more of the following factors would be associated with NSSI, that there are negative emotions right before engagement in NSSI or relational conflict right before NSSI engagement. There's this mental preoccupation with NSSI, which is that fourth C of the four C's model. Also, frequent NSSI related thoughts when the individual is not engaging in the behavior. So they're thinking about it um, even in times when they aren't in um, psychological pain or distress. If they've engaged in five or more days of NSSI in the previous year and it's causing distress or impairment, it's not a socially sanctioned behavior and doesn't occur only during substance use, 
um, or withdrawal, then we are thinking of an NSSI disorder. So again, this is what's been proposed in the DSM. So we'll need to kind of wait and see what uh, future editions of the DSM include. Now, when it comes to the ICD-11 or the International Classification of Diseases that's put out by the World Health Organization, we see that non-suicidal self-injury is in the section for symptoms, signs, or clinical findings not elsewhere classified, specifically those involving appearance or behavior. And they talk about NSSI as being intentional injury to the body that's self-inflicted with the expectation that it will only lead to minor or mild physical harm. And common methods include cutting, burning, hitting, or scraping. So we see that NSSI is recognized in both the IC CD11 and the DSM, and it'll be interesting to see how these diagnoses um, potentially evolve over time. Okay, now since we're talking about NSSI in youth today, I wanted to make sure we talked about social contagion. Social contagion is a concept that refers to instances in which behavior is imitated by others, particularly in their immediate environment or their physical space or physical setting. So if you think about a adolescent who um, experiences death by suicide in a high school, school counselors are typically on alert for social contagion. Might another student imitate this behavior as a result of this death by suicide in their physical environment. Another description of social contagion that I really like is the diffusion of thoughts or behaviors through a social network. So you have a group of peers who start to um, endorse similar thoughts or imitate similar behaviors simply due to their exposure to one another. In light of the value and the importance and the influence of peer relationships, especially during adolescence, Social contagion is something we need to think about when we're considering NSSI among youth. We know that social contagion of NSSI can occur when adolescents are in the same space and one starts to engage in NSSI, others may imitate that behavior. So that space could be school, a treatment facility, a group home, where you have adolescents repeating another adolescent or a peer's NSSI. We also know that knowledge of a peer's NSSI increases the odds of an adolescent's own engagement in self-injury. So as adolescents become aware that their peers are self-injuring, they have a higher risk of engaging in NSSI themselves. We also know that among adolescents who self-injured, about 44% also self-injured um, or had uh, among adolescents who self-injured themselves about 44 percent had friends who self-injured so we see that this happens in peer groups it happens in um, social networks of adolescents now i say all this to introduce this idea that social media and the internet has expanded that immediate setting or environment in which social contagion can take place so we know that we can be exposed to a variety of behaviors from adolescents across the globe simply by logging into our social media accounts or searching the internet for videos and discussion forums and pictures. Um, this is clear in research as well. So there's been a lot of research focused on NSSI content online. Researchers found that among 90 adolescents with a history of NSSI who are in inpatient treatment, greater exposure to NSSI through media, and that could be traditional media or social media, it correlated with more NSSI engagement among the adolescents. So um, when we start to ask ourselves, what content related to NSSI is online. I wanted to show you several things. First, I think it's really interesting um, that Patchen and Hindu, Hinja um, came up with this term, digital self-harm. So digital self-harm refers to anonymous online posting, sending, or otherwise sharing hurtful content about oneself. And that can take a variety of forms, one of which could be pictures of self-injury that occurs offline. So we have this new construct of digital self-harm that we need to consider in, in light of offline NSSI as well among adolescents. So what could adolescents be exposed to online as it relates to NSSI? There are websites with 
tons of information about NSSI, some of which is more accurate than others. Um, some of these informational websites are designed to encourage NSSI or help um, reduce the harm of NSSI among those who are engaging. Others are directing individuals to professional help and helping them understand what their NSSI behavior um, could be linked to. So there are websites about how to clean wounds so they don't get infected, how to avoid scarring when engaging in NSSI, how to conceal wounds from others, how to understand NSSI so that the individual has some sense of why am I doing this, what's the purpose of this behavior, ways to get professional help. There's also discussion boards about NSSI. Um, so when preparing for this um, uh, presentation, I was just looking through some of these discussion boards and there's the question like, where's the best place to cut in summer? And then lots of responses from individuals who say they engage in NSSI and have been able to conceal it successfully during the summer months. When you start to look at pictures and images, there are um, pictures of scars, pictures of actual wounds, um, pictures of instruments used for self-injury. So there's a lot of exposure to these images and even videos. And then finally, we have stories posted online about individuals' experiences with NSSI, um, YouTube videos, there's YouTube channels about um, self-injury and social media posts. So a lot of access to information and images, a lot of exposure to NSSI can occur online. Let's talk about NSSI on social media specifically, given the <clears throat> excuse me, given the importance of social media to adolescents and the almost ubiquitous um, presence of social media among teenagers, particularly in the United States. So a lot of adolescents in the US uh, have access to a smartphone or own a smartphone themselves, and almost 100% have at least one social media account. Um, many have more than one. So when we think about NSSI on social media, we want to look at the community guidelines of these different social media platforms. The fact that NSSI is referenced in almost every social media platform's community guidelines shows us that this is recognized by social media platforms and it's prevalent enough to end up in the community guidelines. So, <clears throat> excuse me, Instagram talks about, we will not allow graphic images of self-harm, such as cutting. Um, they'll not show non-graphic um, content, such as healed scars. So talking about what Instagram will limit in terms of images or posts. TikTok says, do not post, upload, or stream, or share content that depicts, promotes, or normalizes, or glorifies um, self-harm or suicide, or provides instructions for how to engage in these behaviors. Facebook says, we remove any content that encourages suicide or self-injury, excuse me any graphic content. <clears throat> and then finally, Twitter says, you may not promote or encourage suicide or self-harm. And so every social media platform is trying to address this, trying to limit the amount of NSSI related posts and pictures and videos on their platforms. Um, when you search for NSSI content on a lot of these social media platforms, you get a warning message that says something like, can we help? Do you wanna get support? And there's a lot of links to hotlines or um, resources that can help the individual um, reach psychological or uh, counseling services. There are also algorithms that are in play that are trying to block NSSI content. So if you try to um, search or post with a particular hashtag that's been linked to NSSI, like hashtag self-harm, um, algorithms will try to either block that content or um, flag it so that it's removed. Also, users of social media can report uh, disturbing images or NSSI-related content that violates these community guidelines, so it'll be taken down. Despite all of this and all of these efforts, NSSI continues to persist online. Um, so just a couple of statistics to show you how adolescents in particular are still accessing this content. We know that among Korean adolescents who had a recent history of NSSI, 30% had seen it 
um, on social media in the past year, and almost 12% had posted NSSI content on social media in the past year. So there's some activity related to social media and NSSI among those who um, have a history of NSSI. Also, among American young adults, 32.5% who viewed NSSI on social media reported engaging in a similar behavior. So they're seeing it on social media, they're imitating that behavior, that social contagion, which we have discussed. So who are the folks who are um, posting NSSI content online? There was a, a recent study that looked at young adult women who engaged in NSSI in the past year and found that almost a third posted NSSI content online. So they compared those who had a history of NSSI and were posting online versus those who had a history of NSSI and weren't posting it on social media. What they found were that those who posted online had more intrapersonal um, related functions of NSSI. So the anti-suicide, self-punishment, the emotion regulation motives were more common among those who posted online rather than interpersonal functions, which is peer bonding or finding community by posting online and finding others who post online. This was a very interesting finding, showing that these individuals who posted online had more issues related to anti-suicide, um, self-punishment, and emotion regulation rather than that communication motive, which is what you might think when you think about someone posting NSSI content online. Those who posted online also had more clinical symptoms, more suicidal ideation, more cravings for NSSI, lower self-esteem, and lower resiliency. So this is really evidence against that idea that people are just posting on social media to seek attention. Um, unfortunately, one of the consequences of posting NSSI content on social media could be more likes, more followers, more views of the post, which could create more social reinforcement as well. So there's a lot we still need to understand about why adolescents are posting content about NSSI on social media, but the, um, the research that we do have shows that their uh, symptomology might be more severe and that they have more desire for emotion regulation or self-punishment purposes of NSSI rather than just peer bonding. So what are some of the effects of NSSI online activity? Social contagion, which we already discussed, by seeing NSSI online, it could increase curiosity among youth. Um, it might trigger uh, cravings for NSSI among adolescents who are trying to um, refrain from engaging in NSSI. Um, there are some potential benefits that have been reported in the literature, like uh, adolescents can find support, they can find um, others who are devoid of judgment. Uh, they can find help or at least resources to professional help through discussing NSSI online. But like I talked about, it also poses that risk of this creating a cycle of social reinforcement that I post online about my NSSI, I get a lot more followers, a lot more likes, and I feel like I need to continue posting about NSSI to maintain that social reinforcement. Um, so I just liked this quote by researchers who said, whilst not necessarily causal, self-harm content, both textual and pictorial, may have the effect of entrenching or exacerbating self-harm. So we really need to be thinking about NSSI online in our work with adolescents. Okay, so um, I'm going to uh, fast forward here just a little bit uh, in light of how much time we have left. I just wanted to show you some examples of NSSI content on social media. It's going to be really quick. If this is not something that you are prepared to see today, then you can... Um, uh, close out this screen or look away just for a few seconds. But I wanted to show um, viewers what their clients could be accessing on Instagram, for example. So I found these pictures on Instagram uh, simply by changing 
the way hashtags were spelled. So um, rather than using self-harm or NSSI, if you misspell um, some of these words, then it takes you to um, posts that have avoided the algorithm. So you can, uh, the one on the far right was actually a video of showing someone engaging in NSSI and then the, um, the blood that came from that engagement. So uh, that's just a, a little bit of what our clients could be exposed to. So I think as clinicians, we need to be asking our adolescent clients about their exposure to NSSI content on social media, whether or not they are uploading, posting, or sharing NSSI content on social media, and try to understand, again, what does that behavior do for them? Um, what is their experience like as they engage with this NSSI content? content online. It might be part of treatment that we um, create a period of abstinence from um, not only NSSI but also social media um, during at least the beginning part of treatment when we're working with NSSI for some clients that might be helpful so they're not exposed to the content. So how do we assess NSSI? Um, I'm not going to read through all of these. I just wanted you to see their names. You'll have these slides, but the deliberate self-harm inventory is probably the most popular. Um, I like the Alexian Brothers urge to self-injure scale as well because that has more to do with craving. So if you're using the addiction model, if they seem to meet criteria for NSSI as a behavioral addiction, that could be really helpful. A couple of ethical considerations in our work with adolescents, and this is not going to surprise you, but the biggest ethical um, concern is how do we balance protecting client confidentiality with risk management? So during that informed consent with adults and assent with um, our adolescent or minor clients, we want to discuss the limits to confidentiality as related to NSSI specifically so that our adolescent client is informed prior to to their disclosure of NSSI. So they already know that if you um, uh, perceive the risk of serious harm or foreseeable harm, that is a time when you will need to break confidentiality and get caregiver, uh, parent, or guardian involved in that discussion. Uh, so this is a gray area when it comes to NSSI because there are so many different forms of NSSI. So think about your assessment of um, serious harm or foreseeable harm uh, when it comes to an adolescent who's sticking staples into the skin versus cutting with a blade. So so this is why we want to do a thorough assessment about the risk of the NSSI behavior. So we want to assess the risk of severity of the injury. We want to see the risk of unintentional injury. So is the individual ever engaging in self-injury while under the influence of alcohol or other drugs? We want to assess the frequency of NSSI, if there's co-occurring mental health concerns, the age of the client matters, the developmental stage of the client matters that um, the nature of NSSI, do we see it progressing in any way? So maybe they started with staples in the skin, moved to needles, moved to blades. So are we seeing this progression? We want to look at that risk of unintentional um, self-injury. I can't uh, emphasize that enough because part of that foreseeable harm that we're assessing for is could there be unintentional self-injury if they say that they've just started using a blade or there have been times that they've cut deeper than intended. Um, that heightens that risk of foreseeable harm. Um, we also want to assess if NSSI is life-threatening. Um, if it is a life-threatening form of NSSI, like deep cutting, uh, or otherwise if we just feel that based on our client's developmental stage, their age and uh, co-occurring mental health concerns or substance use disorders, this needs to be disclosed. We want to facilitate that, that conversation with the client as being part of the process. So involve the client in every step. It would be great um, if the client were to disclose to the caregiver their engagement in NSSI, but you're going to have clients who are afraid of doing that, so they would want you to do the disclosure, but they would be in the room. Um, you would be there to kind of um, moderate that discussion between the client and caregiver, so we want to involve them in the process when we are going to break confidentiality um, and, and share this information with parent or caregiver.
we always want to assess for co-occurring suicidal ideation. We know that there's a pretty pronounced relationship and correlation there. And when we disclose, um, when we break confidentiality and either our client discloses or uh, we have this conversation with parent or caregiver, we can enlist their support in helping us um, meet treatment goals with our client, um, help prepare parents or caregivers to understand NSSI and be a part of um, the treatment process. Okay, so just a couple of slides on how to respond to NSSI, and I'm gonna go through these uh, rather quickly, but I just wanna highlight a couple pieces. So first, there is a lot of shame that accompanies uh, adolescent NSSI. Uh, they try to hide it, they try to keep it concealed. Um, so we want to make sure that we are approaching it, that we're broaching the subject devoid of evaluation and devoid of judgment. Some of the research about why adolescents are talking about NSSI online says that the adolescents say they feel like there's less judgment, there's less shaming, and there's less evaluation online than there is offline. So we want to be a corrective experience for the adolescent client. We're going to broach with curiosity and with care. Have you ever intentionally hurt yourself without wanting to die? And then hold that space. We're not going to overreact. We're not going to immediately jump to this must be a suicide attempt. Our reaction is really important. So we want to provide that corrective experience. We're going to likely use a formal assessment so that we can get all of the information we need to assess risk. So the frequency, the severity, the circumstances, are there co-occurring mental health concerns? Um, we want to ask about social media use. We want to ask about their other coping um, strategies. So if we were to take away NSSI, how do, would they cope with that overwhelming psychological pain? It is very likely that treatment is going to entail expanding their coping strategies or developing brand new ones. We are going to increase their emotion regulation skills. So there's a lot that's been written on how do we help enhance coping strategies among among adolescents, giving them more adaptive and more effective coping strategies that they can rely on to deal with that psychological pain rather than NSSI. Like other um, behavioral addictions, we also want to do this analysis of what precedes NSSI, um, what does it feel like when the individual is engaging in the behavior, and then what are the consequences, both reinforcements or negative consequences. Um, by understanding the situations and the thoughts and the feelings that occur just before NSSI, we can better understand the function of the behavior, um, cues or triggers for the behavior, and then we can develop plans for how our client is going to cope with those triggers or cues without engaging in NSSI. I did want to highlight that DBT has been used effectively to treat NSSI. Um, it was originally developed for clients with borderline personality disorder, but it has a lot of um, helpful interventions and tools for addressing NSSI. And then also the Treatment for Self-Injurious Behavior, or TSIB, um, this was developed by Peggy Andover, and it has some empirical support for being effective for adolescent clients or young adults who engage in NSSI. It is um, a nine-session intervention that if you look up um, Andover's work, she actually describes um, each of the sessions in depth, so you have a sense of um, what they entail. Um, finally, so I just wanted to show you uh, this list of alternative coping strategies. I have found that if you ask adolescents, how do you cope with psychological pain, they usually stare at you with a blank face. I don't know. I've been engaging in NSSI. That's been my primary means of coping. So think about the variety of coping strategies that you could introduce to your adolescent client that we need to practice with them so we can model it, we can role play, we can give them homework to try it out, come back and report. We want to build up their self-efficacy of using alternative coping strategies so that they start to rely on them and have the confidence that they'll be successful and effective um, rather than turning to NSSI. Finally, a couple resources. So I have written a book on treating behavioral addictions that has a chapter related to NSSI, if you are interested in that lens. Also, um, Kelly Wester and Heather Tripal have an amazing book on non-suicidal self-injury. And also Walsh writes um, a great practical resource on treating self-injury. 
So we'll take just a couple of questions. I'll leave this page up. It has my email address. I also have a Facebook author page of inform information related to behavioral addictions. If you're interested, I write a blog for psychology today and I just completed a mental health academy credential course on behavioral addictions that has a couple modules related to NSSI if you're interested in learning more um, and, and wanna take a full course. I believe it's um, 38 uh, CEs by the time you finish the course. Okay, Amber, do we have time for a couple questions? I think we do. Um, if you'll stick around with us for just a couple more minutes, um, a few have come in into the chat box. Uh, a big one is, will we get to see these slides? And the answer is yes. If you are registered for this event, you'll get a follow-up and you can have all of this amazing information. Um, another one that popped up was, if you knew of any um, research or data looking at transgender youth or non-binary youth, are there differences in terms of you know rates or even types of NSSI among yeah. that group? Such a great great question. So there are just a few studies looking at gender differences. Um, I don't know if the studies had enough um, of non-binary or trans um, clients in order to see significant differences. Um, we do see differences in prevalence rates, particularly among um, clients with marginalized identities or clients who've experienced trauma or um, bullying. And so there is um, evidence to suggest that NSSI could be higher among youth who identify as non-binary or transgender. Um, but if you send me a separate email, whoever asked the question, I can do some research to see if there are specific studies looking at NSSI with either transgender youth or youth of marginalized sexual orientations as well. Um, and just one more here I saw. Uh, are the strategies that you mentioned, would they also be affected for our, our older youth, our emerging adults, young yes. adults? Yeah, so a lot of these um, clinical responses to NSSI uh, can be helpful across the lifespan. You're just going to adjust it based on your client's developmental level. So the um, TSIB um, intervention, that has been used with adolescents and young adults. A lot of the DBT work has been used with adult clients. Um, and then the um, uh, functional analysis and looking for triggers, that can be used across the lifespan enhancing emotion regulation strategies and enhancing coping skills. That's gonna be a common theme with the treatment of NSSI across the lifespan. It'll look different based on if you're working with children, adolescents, adults, or older adults of what those coping strategies might entail or what the development of emotion regulation strategies entail. So I didn't have time to get to the slide, but one of the, um, important features of treatment for NSSI is increasing your client's ability to tolerate distress and then modify or influence their own emotional experiences. And there's a lot of ways we can do that. There are ways that are more geared towards um, younger clients and then more that are geared towards adult clients. So if you kind of dive into that realm of emotion regulation skill enhancement or affect regulation skill enhancement, you're going to find a lot of options that you can either use with clients who are children and adolescents or adult clients as well. But they're going to be common themes across the lifespan, just slight alterations depending upon the client's developmental level. Perfect. All right, I'm going to do one more. And then if we did not get to your question today, please feel free to follow up with Amanda. She's so knowledgeable. We could do a whole Q&A session, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when you're working with a youth who is demonstrating some hesitance to disclose the behavior, um, what are some maybe strategies to address this to make them you know, feel a little bit more comfortable? Yeah, and it's one of the things that we're finding is that therapeutic relationship is so important when the client realizes that you're on their team, that you're not there to evaluate them, you're not there to judge them, that um, you have a sense of what NSSI is, so that again, you're not gonna erroneously think this was a suicide attempt, we need to be talking about inpatient treatment. All of that is really helpful. So by broaching it, but also providing some information about NSSI that you know some youth will 
um, cope with pain in different ways, that some turn to alcohol, some turn to um, sexual activity, some turn to spiritual practices, uh, some try to distract themselves, others actually cause pain to themselves as a way to um, distract from emotional pain. Have you ever engaged in any of these? So I think creating that menu of options like we do in motivational interviewing, presenting it to your client in a really non-shaming, non-judgmental way, uh, kind of normalizing that for some clients with extreme psychological pain, that is their best attempt to cope, really opens that door. And again, I say all this with a caveat of, and you have talked about informed consent and assent um, with your client, they have an idea of if they disclose something that you perceive as serious risk or foreseeable harm, that is something that we will bring in parent or bring in caregiver to discuss. So we wanna make sure that that's already in place so that the client doesn't feel betrayed if they disclose and then we have to break confidentiality. So a lot of things to consider, but one of the important pieces is recognizing that some youth engage in this, so broaching the subject first, letting them know that I'm okay with you disclosing this. Um, it's not going to um, fluster me. I'm not going to shame you for it. Can be such an important corrective experience. Um, other adults in the client's life could have become aware of their NSSI and had a really, really strong reaction. That makes sense. It's coming from a place of fear, and I don't understand this behavior, and I just want you to stop immediately. So how we respond, I think, can invite the client to share more and um, to maybe go through an assessment with us. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, we are going to end here. Thank you to everyone who attended. I will put in a plug for our DBT webinar. We do have a recording of that. So if you're curious, you want just a, you know, a quick intro, uh, search that on our Strengthening the Heartland YouTube channel, and that's another resource for you. Um, thank you so much, Amanda. Always wonderful to have you. And have a wonderful day, everyone. Thanks. Thank you all for coming.